All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to lesson number four, uh, which is the second half of chapter two. We will be covering verses 31 through 39. As you remember last week, the first section of chapter two, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was woken and uh, very disturbed by dreams that he had. And uh, they were so disturbing that he couldn't sleep. He called in all his wise men, all his advisors, and asked them to give him an interpretation. Of course, they wanted to know the dream. He said he couldn't remember it, or it had went from him. We don't really know whether it went from him, or he was using that as a test. It said, no, well, you tell me the dream and the interpretation. And no one could do it. They say not even, the, you know, only the gods could do that. And gods won't give that to any human being. Well, he sent out a command, uh, an order to kill all the wise men in Babylon. They came to Daniel. Uh, and Daniel, with the executioner, struck favor and said that uh, he would like a, a conference with the king. He granted it. King granted Daniel time. Daniel came back to him and said, you know, I, I, I will tell you the dream and its interpretation. And so we kind of finished up last week at, at uh, verse number 30 and right in the middle. So verse 31 is where we're going to pick up where it gives really what the dream was. And then we're going to get into a deep explanation of that. But one thing to think about when it talks about end days and latter days throughout the scripture, it's really talking about end times. It's talking about the second coming, the second advent of Christ. So let's, when we hear end days and latter days, we got to remember that. We also want, said, you know, we got to remember why Babylon? Why is this focus on Babylon? Well, there's two reasons here. It's not Babylon is kind of the center of all false religion and always has been uh, for, for the history prior to this. Uh, Babylon also started what was known as the time of the Gentiles. And it was the, the exile of, of the Jew, Jews from their nation and they were all brought to, to Babylon in, in slavery, essentially. And that was for 70 years. We talked about that before in the previous history. So with that, we're going to get into to number thir uh, verse 31. I'll let Annette read that. It's in, it's in pretty strange with the PowerPoint, but we will get through it. So Daniel 2, verses 31 through 35. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together it became like chaff from the summer threshing floor and the winds carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So what is important as we look at this, what is important for us to know about these 10 toes? I'm gonna to start there. Most of the, the, the statue will be discussed in detail a bit later, but right now, what are we gonna pick here about the 10 toes? What do you notice? The first thing that I want you to notice um, is that they are mixed. Every other um, compound or metal, every other part of the statue um, that was mentioned was a, you know, a pure substance. We have gold, we have silver, we have bronze, we have iron. They were all intact. But the toes are made from two substances, clay, um, and then also iron, which is similar to the metal, which is partly the metal from the legs and partly another um, type of product. So we want you to, to remember and think about that when we get further in, that they were mixed. They weren't, um, they weren't, they, they was made out of two different compounds. The next thing um, that we would want you to remember is that there are 10 of them, okay? There's 10 toes. This may or may not have significance. Um, one thing that we, we do know is um, that some commentators will say that um, this, re 
this um, directs us to an exact number of 10 leaders, 10 countries, 10 somethings, um, and this number is literal. There are other commentators who say that the number 10 that is used here is just a figurative number and it means more than, you know, more than two or three, but not a hundred. I mean, it's just a meaning a set or a group that's, that's brought together. But just keep this in mind as we go on that it's a mixed composition and that it is um, a specific number. There is a number there. Right. And some, some commentators will hang their hat on the number and say it will be this number. It may increase and decrease over time, but it will be this number. And, and like Ned said, others don't agree with that. And we're going to get into the explanation of this a lot more because these verses are going to be repeated down here. So we want to get into that deeper explanation as we move forward. But what is the significance of Nebuchadnezzar hearing of a great mountain? He says, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain, and it filled the whole earth. What's the significance of that to Nebuchadnezzar? What, does that have any bearing on him at all? We, we know that the great mountain that God will form his millennium, his kingdom on, Mount Zion, we know that that's God's great mountain, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know that. That's all future. Daniel really doesn't know that, but he's been given a picture of the future. Uh, but one thing that's interesting for Daniel using this symmetry or, or, or a reference like this to, to Nebuchadnezzar is that from archaeology and uncovering, Nebuchadnezzar's God was Bel, his chief God. The God of gods was Bel, we heard Baal, but it was Bel Medardak. That was his chief God. Well, archaeology has found that this God's special name that is recorded in, 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 in the archaeological findings, his name was Shadu Radu. And the meaning of Shadu Radu, Radu is the great mountain. So Daniel is using this great mountain, and that is the exact name of Nebuchadnezzar's chief god, believe it or not. So that's how this ties together and brings Nebuchadnezzar into what, I mean, this probably, it, he was all, he was struck and awesome as it was, and now he's bringing together this image of the, of the mountain. And what, what does that mean? So we'll go to the next verse. So um, we have um, the, this image of the statue. We just want to give you it in total. We are going to break it apart. Well, we're not going to break it apart, but we will um, dissect it um, and, and label and discuss each section. But this is it in total. So the next scripture is verses 36 through 38. This is the dream, meaning what the scripture, the scripture we just read, that was the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them, and you are this head of gold. And so we know that, the, that Babylon um, was in existence as a world power from 605 to 539. Um, one thing that's important that we don't have a question about it, but I'll just stress to you is the importance of Nebuchadnezzar. God really, and we say, why did God use Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was one of the only um, totalitarian, really, David told you many, many times how well-rounded he was. He was a brilliant architect and a brilliant warrior and strategist, and he was very wise, you know, he, he was extremely talented man and he was a true ruler over everything. And we'll see as other rulers come along, they don't quite have total and complete control as Nebuchadnezzar did. And so Daniel's telling him that God recognizes you as a king of kings. You are the ultimate of a king as far as how your power is wielded and that God has honored you even with the birds of the heaven and given them into your hand. Um, and he rules over everything in his kingdom. Um, so we want to remember that about Nebuchadnezzar. That'll come up repeatedly while we're studying this. 
So the question is, is who are the we that are giving the interpretation? If you look up here, it says, this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation. So who is the we? God and Daniel. Okay, that's very good. Um, the, it's definitely Daniel, if you remember from last week, Daniel was very specific, very adamant in everyone he dealt with, letting them know that this had nothing to do with him. He is absolutely no, no contribution whatsoever, that it was completely God, that if this was going to be able to be, if he was going to be able to know the dream, and if he was going to be able to interpret the dream, 100% that was, that was God giving it to him. He had nothing to do with it. And so when we say we, um, definitely, I believe if, if Daniel's the only person in the room, he is talking about he and God. Um, there is some speculation that perhaps, if you remember from last week, he drew in his three companions, Hananiah, um, uh, Meshiel, and Azariah also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, known as their Babylonian names, he pulled them together in with him to pray about this dilemma. And so it's possible that they were in the room, although if they were in the room, they were probably in the background and it was just Daniel and possibly the chief executioner may have been standing next to him in the presence of the king. But if you remember, he was brought to... Um, <coughs> excuse me. He was brought to um, the king by the chief ex executioner. Yeah, and you, you note again that Daniel is very, very clear here, pointing out to Nebuchadnezzar where he's getting this power from. <laughs> he's getting it from God. And so, so that's important as we move down here because he's, he's making it clear that you're the king. God's given you this. You didn't do it on your own. So verses 39 through 43. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's, potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partially of iron and partially of clay, so the kingdom shall be partially strong and partially fragile. As you saw iron mixed with somatic clay, they will mingle with the seed of man, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Ooh, all right, what does all that mean? Well, one thing we're going to get into is we'll get into the statue in, in the next slide, and we're going to explain the gold, the silver, the bronze, the, the uh, iron legs, and the feet. But what does it really mean in verse 39 when it says that they will be inferior to yours? And I didn't catch this initially because I thought inferior meant less, not as powerful, but that's totally inaccurate. The word used here when you go back to the original Greek, and this was actually read, written in Aramaic. Oh, uh, the fact is, is that it means of a lower section below you. It means a step down from you, not in power, not in anything. As a matter of fact, when we look at the statue, when we look at the kingdoms, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the shortest kingdom there was in all the kingdoms that's described here. So it has really nothing to do with being inferior in any shape, fashion, or form. It just means that they are a step down from him. The other thing that you could look at if you want to take of lower, then we know that gold is higher value than silver. Silver is inferior to gold uh, in value. Uh, bronze is inferior 
to silver and gold in value, and iron is inferior to uh, bronze, silver, and gold. So you can look at it from that standpoint. You could also look at it on the, the weight of the substance. Gold is the heaviest, the densest substance there is, followed by silver, followed by brass, followed by, uh, followed by iron. So you can look at it that way as well. But the fact is, while it decreases in value and it decreases in its uh, weight contents, it increases in strength. And as we look at this statue, we look at the kingdoms that it represents, they actually get stronger while their representation of what's here actually gets weaker. So it's interesting how I use that. And when we look at these kingdoms, we know three of them will actually be defeated. And we'll talk about that, but one really never gets defeated. We'll get that too in just a minute. So the next question, what is ceramic clay? I, th I find that an odd. Here we've got these four metals and then the feet are mixed with ceramic clay. Does anybody know um, your versions? If you're looking at your Bible, it may um, list miry clay and the others um, has been listed as pottery clay. Um, that's other versions. So what do you think ceramic clay is? Is there a significance here? Uh, mine, mine says my, miry, and then uh, there's a marginal note in my Bible that says another, an, an alternative is uh, earthenware. Uh, okay. So ceramic clay is a cr clay made out of dust. You know, we have different types of clay, but this is a clay that starts as a dust, and of course you add the water. And this is, a, as you said, the earthenware. It is the clay used to make tiles, ceramic tiles, ceramic uh, pottery. And so what we know is it's extremely brittle, breaks very easily. Um, so there have been people that try to draw an analogy. And I want to be careful about um, drawing an analogy from each and every word. Although I don't think, as I said before, I don't think God puts things into the Bible just randomly for flowery language. I think almost everything there has a meaning. But they say, if you look at ceramic clay that comes from dust, um, this is um, referring to man coming from dust and going back to dust at death. And which kind of leads into the next question that Dave has. Yeah, so what does it mean to be mixed with the seeds of men? And I'm going to give you a couple of different alternatives here, but does anybody have any suggestions before I give you what the alternatives to some of the commentators were? There's one commentator which I don't particularly agree with, but references that these this seeds of men is representing really all... Uh, the, the Nephilims, the angels that interbred with humans and became a mixed race, became a, a hybrid gene in the human race in which God used uh, Noah and the flood to wipe out. And he also instructed Joshua to slaughter every man, woman, and child to make sure this hybrid gene got, never came back into to existence. I'm not sure I have any other than one commentator that points that out. So I, I take that with somewhat of a grain of salt, but I pointed out that is, that is somebody's opinion. The most thought about here is that the seeds and men referring here is that he's really talking about the 10 toes, which we'll see as 10 nations, which we see as 10 kings. And we'll see that they will try to intermix among themselves, kings, when there's a monarch, when the monarchies were in place, would get, take a son of one king and the daughter of a king of, a, of, a, of another nation and try to marry them so they could bring the nations together. No one has ever been successful in bringing these nations of the Roman occupied western side of Roman uh, empire ever together. No one has been successful in bringing Great Britain, Germany, Spain, France, oh, no one has ever brought them together up under a single rule. Now, they have tried many times, and they have all failed. And what it's saying is that 
there will be seeds of men, but they will not gel together. They will not form unity or conformity, and they will be weak as a structure, even though some would be strong. You know, Portugal is probably weak. We consider Germany as strong. So there will be mixtures of weak and, and strong nations, but nothing will bring them together. And he's referring to this really as the 10 toes, which really doesn't exist until, I say this, until time of Antichrist. So this is not something in place today. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. So let's, let's get to the slide. And we use kind of a, uh, uh, we had very many slides to look at and some of them were extremely detailed. Uh, I know I received one from Lane that was just great, but it was, it was detailed. So we're gonna use more of a summary view of this thing because this has been picked at and, and, and looked at over the years by commentators and commentators and commentators. I can tell you what we're presenting is very much in line with all the commentators. This is one of the few areas when you start reading commentators, they all agree upon, <laughs> so, which is really unusual. So when you look at this statue that was in his dream, the head of the statue is Babylon. He was only around for 43 years and actually Nebuchadnezzar wasn't there the whole time. So it was a short lived kingdom out of all of them. Its value was around gold. Nebuchadnezzar was in, you know, he was just enthralled with getting gold. He brought gold back from every place. His palace was layered in gold. He had gold cups, gold plates to eat on, gold utensils. It was just gold, gold, gold. So it says that this is really a resemblance to gold is Babylon. And Daniel says, the gold is you. You're the king of Babylon. So no question about that. The next is silver. You notice the head is singular. The silver has two pieces, has two arms. The head is, as uh, Annette said, Nebuchadnezzar ruled solely, sovereignly. No one had any input except he made the final decision. He was solely in charge. When you get the, the Medo-Persian empire, it was ruled from different arms. And it's silver. Oddly enough, their coinage was made of silver. They value silver. There was silver everywhere. And then when you get to the next one, which is Greece, you notice Medo-Persia lasted 200 years. Uh, Greece lasted 300 years up under Alexander the Great. But the fact is, is that it was a bronze and it is of multiple groups too. But its fact is, is that bronze is the weaker, but all of Greece's shields and, sh and swords and things were made of bronze. So they were known as bronze. And then the last leg of this empire, which is Rome, and we say Rome, Rome was never conquered. So let's not forget that. Rome came apart at the seams. And so what happened to Rome was it got to be so big because it included, give you a little bit of history here, as Rome got into existence, it was basically a democracy. And it was up under a rule in which nations started coming to Rome to join the democracy, to, do, to join the group, to get protection, to get food. So a lot of the Northern, uh, Bulgarian tribes the, would come and ask, can we be admitted into your group? And they would admit them up under the condition is that number one is they followed all their rules and regulations. And number two, they had to accept Christianity as their only language, only religion. So Rome was building these nations, bringing them in. They had to be Christianity, had to be the religion. And they were bringing, bringing these in and, uh, forming a bigger and bigger area. It got so big, it got unwilded. It couldn't rule it. So they divided it into the Western Kingdom and the Eastern Kingdom. The Western Kingdom <laughs> finally came apart, not by a revolution, not by anybody defeating anybody. It just broke apart in 400 uh, AD, uh, where they became separate nations 
up under no common rule. The Eastern Roman Empire lasted until the 1400s. So it lasted almost 1500 years. It too really never got defeated. So there's never been any type of empire that's ever been in place like Rome. And when we get to the 10 toes and 10 pieces at the bottom, this gets to be, and I'll say this, why are none of the four that I just listed debated? Because Daniel tells you who they are later in Daniel. <laughs> so, so you can't, there's no reason to argue because he tells you who these are in later chapters of, of his own book. So it's very clear who these kingdoms are. He never tells us who the 10 toes are and who the 10 kings and the 10 toes are. We get some indication of this, but that, because it's not told to us very clearly, that's up for, for debate. And some think it's the world, the one world union. Some think it's the European union. We're gonna get into those, those discussions. But the fact is the 10 toes, the feet that are iron and clay, it, it, it's clearly not here today. And clearly, it will be here at the time Christ comes for the second event. So, and then we get into this stone, which we'll get into that, that, that crushes the feet. So, we're going to get into that at, at the end. But if you look at uh, the, the statue, you, you notice that we go from, as I said, value at the very highest value at the top to the very lowest of clay and iron at the bottom. But the strength of the empire is in opposite, which is ironical that it would be laid out that way. Until you get to the feet. Until you get to the feet. And the, the feet is a union, but we're not quite sure. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there was a professor, Alexander Tyler, that wrote 200 years ago. And I'm going to give you a summary with this, which I thought was amazing. Because we talk about the, the, the 10 kingdoms and the 10 codes. You, the USA is not mentioned anywhere. Huh? Where's America? Not mentioned. Well, neither is China, neither is Russia, neither is Japan, neither is Australia. So I wouldn't get hung up on that too much, even though there's people that say, I mean, oh, United States will not be around at this time because it's not in the Bible. I, I don't believe that. I don't know that we understand this union that comes together. But Professor Alexander Tyler writing about the Greek Empire uh, 200 years ago when, when America was still 13 colonies. So take this back, America is still 13 colonies. This is what he wrote. And I found it pretty shocking. He stated that a democracy cannot work, emphatic, a democracy cannot work for the people will quickly learn that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From then on, they will vote for whoever offers the most benefits and eventually this government will collapse and be followed by a dictatorship. And that's what's happened to most democracies. Remember, America was never a democracy. Our forefathers said that we are a republic, not a democracy. And so I found this interesting that democracies, democracies in their purest form cannot exist a long, a long term. And so I don't want to look at that and say, okay, if this is what he's saying, that means USA doesn't exist anymore. No, it doesn't. I think we have our challenges today. and We all know that. We all know we're, we're facing a, a state and time in, which is unprecedented, unprecedented in any shape, fashion, form. But I don't know that these 10 toes and 10, uh, Ten toes about the feet really have to do with a, a European Union, or does it have to do with a union and a world one world order? And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we'll go go to the next slide, which is an interesting piece, a tidbit of history. So it's really evident that I don't think any of us would doubt that God um, directs events in history, or has had His hand all over events in history. Um, to have outcomes um, to, to go along with his plan and his de desired endpoint. 
And the Battle of Waterloo is a really, I found this extremely interesting. So the battle, and, and I was not really privy, I didn't really know about this history before learning it through studying for this, this Daniel. But the Battle of Waterloo was, had two generals, two competing generals. We all know about, about um, Napoleon. Um, I, you know, I've always heard about Napoleon. I had not heard so much about the Duke of Wellington. So Napoleon was the general on the French side um, and uh, the Duke of Wellington was on the British side. They were both very, very similar lives. And in, in fact, almost freakily similar lives, almost spookily uh, uh, similar lives. They were both born on an island. Um, they both uh, in the same year, not too far apart. Um, they both had three sisters and four brothers, exactly. They both lost their fathers at an early age. Both went to military school in France. Both excelled in mathematics. Both became lieutenant colonels within one day of each other. Um, many feel that God swayed this battle to Wellington um, because if he had not won, the world uh, map at the time would have looked much differently. Of course, France was trying to bring everything in to be one country under France. And the Duke of Wellington was fighting for countries to remain sovereign as they were. Um, but God apparently, or what the thought is, did not wish Europe to be one single country. And so they did not let Napoleon win. And it's interesting how Napoleon really was storming through the continent, um, very successful and excellent strategist, doing a really good job. Um, and it looked like France might become this world empire, this whole thing, similar to the way Rome was. But then he goes to fight a battle in Russia. And the interesting thing is it was this freak snow uh, storm that came through and shut down the battle and caused illness and cut off supplies. So Napoleon lost that battle with Russia. That was one of his first losses. And so turned around and headed back and went to Waterloo. And this is where he met Wellington and had the battle. And, and many feel that there's no reason that um, Napoleon should have lost the way he lost, um, but that he, he lost because God swayed the battle over to Wellington to maintain Europe as separate and sovereign uh, countries and not one unit. Um, very interesting thought. I don't, I don't know history well enough um, to say yes or no, but I, I thought it was interesting. And, and the comment, the, where we got this from had directed this back to Daniel's dream of there being 10 toes um, and that, that there needs to be a union of nations in the end time for God, Christ comes back and not a single union. Um, other dictator, other people have tried to, to um, un unify Europe into one global entity again. We have people like Hitler, many others who have tried and failed. So we think that definitely God has his hand in the events of history. Clearly God directs man and history and events um, leading us all on his path. And I just, I found this absolutely fascinating that really this battle of Waterloo can be directed back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in 605 BC, I think is when it happened. So it's, it's interesting to, to a point here is that God's hand is in this result of what happens to Rome. You said what I mean. Rome kind of dissolved, and it's most people's opinion that Rome will come back together in some form. We may not even recognize it as Rome, but the Antichrist, most people think, will come from Rome uh, as a whole. And Daniel's dream, written, you know, 500 and something years before Christ was even born, 600 years before Christ was born, lays out the history of the Gentiles from Nebuchadnezzar's rule to 
Neo-Persian rule to the Greek rule and to Roman rule. And he states nobody defeats Rome. Nebuchadnezzar gets defeated. Neo-Persians get defeated. The Greeks get defeated. Nobody defeats Rome. And Rome will never come back together until it's time. So it's interesting on how all that is put together in from a, a dream that Daniel puts in scripture from 500 BC. So, Point of correction, though, I don't think the Antichrist is coming from Rome. It's supposed to come from the Carpathian Mountains, but have the full support of the Roman okay. Empire, just, just so people that's, would know that that's what you meant. Right. Was there a question? Okay. okay. Moving into the next set of verses. And in the days of these kings, the God of the heaven will set up a kingdom which shall lie, which, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So, obvious. What's the what's the purpose of this dream? So, you know, ultimately, the kingdom of God will eliminate all other kingdoms, is the way I see it. You know, and 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 God's kingdom will be eternal. And, and uh, all other kingdoms will pass. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right. Robert. When we look at this and we think of, you know, the, the dream, the, the dream laid out prophecy in the level of detail that many people argue had to be written as a history book, not as a prophecy book. It's, it's no one somebody in 500 BC, 600 BC can talk about the kingdoms that would exist in this part of the world, which was the known world at the time, and how long they would last and who would succeed each one. The piece that's on left here, as I mentioned, is the 10 toes. So we can use the prophecies and now the history because we're now 2000 years past to see that what Daniel wrote was absolutely right on. What's not right on is what hasn't been done yet. And that's the end time prophecies. And that's why the book of Daniel is so tightly integrated to the book of Revelation and what's happening with end time prophecy. The fact is, is that it tells of future events those events from our history we see as 100% accurate so that it, we should have all the faith that what he's writing that is yet to be done will be done just like he said it will be done. And that's why I tell you there's some commentators that says there's going to be 10 nations. I don't care what you say at the time this happens because Daniel is so specific in what he's saying that every part of his prophecy has been that accurate. And it will be the same accuracies associated with the end times. Yeah, and what you mentioned, yes, there's one, there's going to be one kingdom that's left, God's kingdom. But God crushes these other kings. It says that he will destroy them. Think about Armageddon, what happens is you have all the nations and the kings come against Christ and they're all crushed immediately. And so this is prophecy that Daniel is telling us is going to happen that we ought to really believe in. <laughs> and we ought to really take to heart because the fact is all the rest of the prophecy that he laid out has been 100% accurate. 
So with that, next question. So what do you think the stone is not cut by hands? I, I, I don't know. I'm a guess. I'm guessing. And then, <laughs> but, I, you know, it keeps coming to mind. The, uh, the stone which the builders rejected has been made the head of the corner. So I think it's that stone. <laughs> That, that, is, that is correct. And nobody kind of tries to find another meaning. Um, the stone is Christ, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And um, there are several places in the Bible that refer to the Messiah as the, the stone or the rock. Um, you've got Zechariah, Psalms, Isaiah, all of them using the terminology of rock to discuss, to, to describe the Messiah. Um, it's important to know that he did not destroy Rome or the Roman Empire with his first coming and that that is something that is being reserved for his second coming. Um, there are some people that would say that there are some, we, I said there's not much debate. There is a little bit of debate and that there's a small faction of people that want to say that the rock is the church, that the church is going to destroy all of these, um, these mm -hmm. empires. And there's not, I mean, that doesn't really make sense. First off, the, the church has never come in and destroyed anything or gotten anything taken away. Um, we don't save people by destroying. Um, we don't, I mean, it, it just doesn't make really very good sense that it is the church. And so I think overwhelmingly, most people agree that um, this stone not cut by hands is Christ. He that, you know, the, using the term, why use the term not cut by hands? Um, it could have just been like an avalanche or a bowl, you know, rock slide where the rock just breaks away from the mountain and comes down. But they specifically are saying it wasn't cut by human hands because human hands didn't have anything to do with um, Christ's uh, birth or his resurrection. This was all done by God. And so it pretty overwhelmingly can be, I, I think we're very safe in interpreting this as that God meant this to reference Jesus Christ. And, and the next question is, why, what did the stone strike and why? Didn't strike the head or the chest plate or the, leg. what did it strike? It struck the feet. And the, free, the feet is the weakest part of the statue. It's made of iron and clay that will not bind together. And so you actually have this top heavy statue that is standing there and it's like exploding a building. You go to the building at this foundation point and you set a piece of dynamite and it goes wham and the whole building comes crumbling down in the ashes and dust. That's the vision I get here with this stone striking. But the issue here is, I struggle with, is it talks about striking and all of it crumbling. The fact is, the only thing that's left when Christ comes is the feet. So while I think Daniel's giving you the whole thing crumbles, Babylonian empire goes away. The neo persian goes away. The Greek empire goes away. The Roman empire just dissolves of itself, just abandons itself. So there's nothing crumbling there. They just go away. But the feat is what's in operation when Christ returns. It's the king's that are here when Christ returns. That's why I think it references the feet. It's the weakest part, but it's also the part that's still here on Christ's second return. Interesting. Um, what is a kingdom that will last forever? This is easy. Whoever wants to raise their hand and get an easy question. Who has a kingdom that will last forever? <laughs> God's. <laughs> God's kingdom. That's true. Um, there's no question that Christ will rule over all nations. When Christ comes, um, all powers, all nations, all everything will, we, will be gone, and it will be Christ um, in rule from the millennium to the new heavens and the, and the new earth. So it's the kingdom of heaven, and it's God's kingdom. 
And so the next question I think is really interesting when you think about it. Why give this prophecy so early in history? We're talking about 600 BC. Why, why, is, that, why is this prophecy given at this point to Daniel? Any thoughts there? What has just happened? Nebuchadnezzar sieged Jerusalem. There was, been, it was three sieges. The first one, he took Daniel and some other people. The last siege, he leveled Jerusalem completely. So there was no more Jerusalem, no more temple, no more walls. It was leveled. And all of the Israelites, the Jews, were taken in captivity, in exile to Babylon, in slavery, basically. Their whole nation is gone. What are they thinking? God's <laughs> abandoned us. God's forgot us. God's not true to his covenant. He's not living up to what he said he would do. We would be his people, right? So God is given this history while they're in exile. Um, what's referred to is the time of the Gentiles, which is referenced in Luke as well. And it's a time of Gentile rule, which is what it is. Jerusalem never comes back to where it was. Even when it gets to rebuild the empire up under Cyrus, which we'll, we'll get into because actually Daniel if you remember chapter one, it says rules all the way until Cyrus, which Cyrus is Medo-Persian. And he becomes the ambassador to another whole different empire rule. So the, the history here is given at this point in time to encourage the Jews that are in exile, that are in slavery, that God has not done with them. <clears throat> God will deliver them. God's covenant will hold up to them. But I think just as importantly, it describes to us how important it is for us to know what the end is. Why? Because when we know what the end is, we put our trust and faith in Christ Jesus. When we know what the ultimate end is and we believe in that ultimate end, we do not worry about the world we're in today or where it's going. We do everything we can to bring every single person to know Christ. That's all we can do. We can't govern the politics and we can't govern the things that are going on in immorality within our nation, within the world and everything that's going on. The only thing that we can do is try to bring more people to know Christ. And so if you believe this prophecy, now you have hope for the future because you know the future. You have certainty. The only thing certain in life other than death and taxes, that's a funny part, the only thing certain in life is the Bible. And what's certain about the Bible is it tells us what's going to happen. And so we're one of the few groups of people, Christianity, that can live in full certainty of life, knowing where we're going, knowing that it's all laid out. Our only job here is to bring as many people with us as we possibly can. And down the last few verses. Forty-six through forty-nine. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel, and said, "Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon." Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel he sat in the gate of the king. So was the offering and incense from the king, um, 
being there on his face before Daniel worshiping Daniel? Do you think he was worshiping Daniel? The thing that's important for us to get from this is Nebuchadnezzar was a very religious man. I'll say religious. He believed in his gods. He went through the practices of his religion. He put a lot of stock in his gods. Um, Daniel had been very forthright with him in saying that, um, no, he shouldn't, th that he had nothing to do with this. This is all my God revealing this to me um, to reveal to you. God, God is giving this to you. This, this dream and this revelation. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar falling down, uh, he's not worshiping Daniel, is not offering offerings and incense up to Daniel. It's his, his demonstration that um, he recognizes that the God of Daniel, of the Israelites, is stronger and more powerful than his God um, that he's been worshiping, that his gods, his little statue gods did nothing um, to help the wise men be able to interpret his dream or help him even know the dream, whatever, that, that they were helpless or in this situation. And so he gets um, quite a bit of um, um, respect for the God of, the, of Israel. And we just need to remember that Daniel was made it so clearly plain that this had nothing to do with him um, that I don't think Nebuchadnezzar would bow down and worship Daniel. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was this demagogue. There's no way that he would um, worship any man, let alone a child captive slave um, in his employ. So I, we think that this really is his falling down on his face before the God of Israel um, and the messenger, and Daniel just happened to be the messenger that brought <laughs> Yeah, and what impact did this correct interpretation have on Nebuchadnezzar? One, as we heard, he recognized that Daniel's God was a God of gods, but also he recognized Daniel and made Daniel, you know, basically uh, all, put him in charge of the whole providence, and, including all the other wise men now reported to Daniel. So he was elevated to basically the prime ambassador, minister. prime minister, or whatever you want to call it. And he didn't forget about his guys, right? He petitioned the king to also bring in Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Nimdigo to basically be his under underling and serve in different capacities. Though he sat in, in the gate of the king, he was in, in lead position. So the impact was Daniel now went from a death sentence to being uh, basically promoted to be the highest level in the nation. Who does that sound like? Uh, yeah, Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Daniel and Joseph <laughs> are two, two guys that are very, very similar in that. But we talk about Nebuchadnezzar, we got something here that, you know, did he really feel this way, that your God is the God of gods? Oh, Daniel, oh, this, oh, that. Let me tell you something. I think it's short-lived. We'll get into that next week, and we'll see just how short-lived that is. Just and so we'll hold that, that off for next week as a teaser. Just how impacted he was. Right. So as we go to wrap up, you know, we, we've kind of brought this down into kind of a, 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 less, a, a less narrow view, a more widely view, is because when you get into these different empires, uh, whether it be the Neo-Persian, whether you be the Greek, or whether it be the Roman. As you move into the book of Daniel, we're going to get into more of those, and it blows you away as a detail he gets into. So we didn't need to spend a lot of history and time around that because that's going to be repeating as we move through the book of Daniel. And that's why we wanted to give kind of just a high-level overview 
of, of the meaning of this statute. And that's also why Bling's um, diagram, I want to use it later on as we start adding the extra right. the, from chapter seven and other things, because it's very detailed and it's very, mm -hmm. so we're going to, we want to bring in this really good chart um, when we have more, when we add more data to it. Mm -hmm. So any closing comments before we go to closing prayer? Wasn't this fascinating? I loved how all of this came together in the history part of it and how it's it, it clearly because it was so specific um, and it all happened. That's why they try to say that this was written in like the second century. That couldn't possibly have been written by Daniel. And it's just fascinating. Anyway, let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your exciting word, this living word. And, and as David said, I, I think that this book of Daniel gives us hope. If he could spell out exactly what's going to happen, which is so much in our history, so we there's no question that it happened, um, it does give us hope for the future and, and your plan for us, um, your church and your believers and your children um, toward the end times. And so we just pray that we look to you with anticipation and, and longing and, and joy in knowing that you are in control and you are making um, the paths of um, this world uh, align with your plan. We pray that you'd be with us as we go throughout this week. Help us as we contemplate and begin chapter three um, and looking at this, this, this King Nebuchadnezzar who doesn't quite get it. Uh, we pray that we would not be as hard-headed as he is. Please help us all as we continue in your word. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, crowd. Until next week. <laughs>